Welcome to the BYU Family History webinar series. I'm Marin, and I'll be your host today. We're glad that you could join us. Please make sure that your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide a smooth webinar. During the webinar, if you're having any technical difficulties, you can use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use that chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our upcoming webinars are on the 21st, uh, so that'll be next week, Thursday at 4 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, and we'll be hearing from Susan Kaufman. She's going to uh, give us an overview of what it's like researching at the Clayton Library in Houston, Texas. And then following that, we will have a webinar with James Tanner. And he will be giving a presentation on how to take uh, better photos for um, family history and genealogy. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, you can visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded on the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to the recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we're pleased to hear from Catherine Grant, who will be giving a presentation on the um, person page memories tab in Family Search Family Tree. Uh, after years on the sidelines, Catherine started doing family history and discovered that she loved it. Her specialty is making new family historians find success and maybe even avoid some of the mistakes she's made. Catherine teaches Sunday classes at the BYU Family History Library. She also presents at Riverton Saturday seminars and other family history events. Her column on family history ran in the Nauvoo Times for about a year and is still available online. Catherine works for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as a technical writer and instructional designer focusing on usability and process improvement. Besides family history, she loves uplifting music, thought-provoking books, and watching the sunrise. And as Catherine gets her presentation set up, uh, I will just finish. There we go. Um, one second. I just need to take Catherine off mute and then we'll be ready to start. Wonderful. Marin, thank you so much. And everybody, thank you for joining us today for this webinar. This is probably one of the most exciting webinars for people because who doesn't love memories? So before we started, I wanted to give a shout out to Beth Ann Wiseman. She's a quality assurance engineer on the memories team at Family Search, and she has been instrumental in fact checking this webinar and making sure that everything's accurate and complete. So, Beth Ann, thank you. I wanted to point out that this is one of three webinars that I'm doing on memories. This is, of course, the as Marin said, the it's on the memories tab of the person page in Family Tree. We've already had this uh, second webinar, actually, Basics of the Gallery, and you can find that on the uh, BYU Family History Library webinar recording page. And then in the future, we're going to be doing this third one about gallery power features. So that'll be for users that have a lot of memories and maybe are looking for some advanced functionality. So if you're one of those people, watch for that webinar because it will be coming up. So let's go ahead and look at what we'll be covering in today's webinar. First of all, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, we'll just do a brief review of how Family Search uses the term memories, because it's not exactly the same as we might use in casual conversation. Then we're going to cover the layout of the Memories tab on the Person page, and we'll talk about how to add memories how to add details about memories, and then finally, some other options that FamilySearch provides to make your user experience even better. Okay, so what are memories on FamilySearch? There are four types. There are photos, there are stories, there are documents, 
and there are auto, audio recordings. Now, photos and audio recordings probably seem pretty straightforward, right? We all have a, a good sense of what those are. But people sometimes get confused between stories and documents because don't they kind of sound like the same thing? And so we might be thinking, well, what could the difference be? Is it based on the content? Does a document have a certain kind and a story has a different kind? But actually, the difference between the two is that stories are typed directly into an online form on FamilySearch.org, whereas documents are files that are created elsewhere, such as a PDF, and then uploaded. The content actually has nothing to do with the distinction between stories and documents. It's just how they were created. So that's a good thing to be aware of. This is also a good time to mention that Family Search is family friendly, which means that all photos that you upload are screened for appropriateness. Now, I find Family Search's guidelines to be very reasonable. They're, um, it's not anything really that you wouldn't expect. It's just common sense. You just want to avoid things that you wouldn't want children to see. So no violence, no nudity. And then also, they don't want people posting spam. They don't want people posting copyright, you know, materials that would be a copyright violation. So pretty much, if you just use common sense, you'll, you'll be okay on that. The complete guidelines and policies, I've only seen the link to them one place, and that is when you're doing an upload from the gallery page. I might have missed it if it's someplace else, but so far that's the only place I've seen it. So for your convenience, this is actually a live link right here. Of course, it's not going to be live on the recording because that's an, going to be an mp4 file but if you look at this slide deck this link will be live and I'll give you a link at the end of the webinar where you can look at any slide decks for any of the webinars that I've done. If a photo violates policy you will get a very nice email notification. How do I know that? first-hand experience. So I accidentally uploaded something that I should not have. It was a complete mistake, but I got a very nice email back from FamilySearch saying, hey, you just uploaded something. It violates our policy. I mean, they said it so tactfully, and they said, you know, it's not, not in keeping with our policy, but if you believe that it, it really is, uh, please email us back. We're willing to talk to you about it. So I was actually really impressed with the way that they handled this. So just know that if you ever do upload something and it's not right, you'll get an, a really nice email and a chance to, to correct the error if there is or to help them realize that it wasn't really an error. And then finally, text and audio are not screened. For those of you who have been using Family Tree for a while, you may remember when text was screened. But I think uh, I, actually, I better not speculate. I don't know why they stopped. It might be due to the large number of um, you know, files that are being uploaded. But for whatever reason, Family Search no longer screens text, and they never screened audio as far as I know. But we as users can kind of be alert to any issues. So for instance, if you see spam uploaded as a memory, then you can go ahead and report that. There's actually an, a report abuse button and we'll be looking at that later on. So just we, as long as we keep things family friendly, it's all good. Now, people often ask, what about videos for memories? Because we're, we live in such a visual society now. I mean, it's so exciting. We've got our smartphones with us. You can take a video at the drop of a hat. And they're so fun. You can, like, I love seeing my other family members' videos on Facebook or Instagram or wherever. So what about family search? Well, they have had to make the determination that videos cannot be uploaded as memories. The main reason for that, according to Beth Ann, is that there just aren't the resources to screen them. So all visual media are screened, and you can imagine if they were to allow videos, there would be probably hundreds of thousands of hours of videos that would need to be screened, and it's just not practical. And so you can actually, when you create a memory, you can link to a video that's hosted someplace else, but you aren't able to upload a video file. So just wanted to be clear about that. Okay, let's look at the layout of the Memories tab to get familiar with it. 
How do you access it? Well, you go to any person page and you click memories. And these, it's important to keep in mind that unlike the gallery, which is all your memories, no matter who they're attached to, if you click memories on a person page, you will only see the memories that are for that specific person. So when you click the memories tab, you will see a page that looks very similar to this. And the four sections on the page match the four types of memories that we just talked about. So in other words, photos, documents, stories, and audio. Now you may have noticed that there are little arrows next to the title of each section. This comes in handy if you need to collapse the section and then you, of course, you click the arrow again to expand it. So you might think, what, when would that be helpful? Well, one time that I found it helpful was I was working on a page that had a lot of photos, but then I wanted to focus on documents. And I kept having to scroll past these dozens of photos and it just was getting a little tedious. So it was very nice to be able to click the arrow next to photos and collapse that section so that I could just focus on the document section, which is what I was working on at that time. Now, I wanted to talk about the portrait for a minute, even though strictly speaking, that's not part of the memories tab. It's visible on all the tabs because it's part of the banner. So no matter whether I click details or timeline or whatever, that portrait is always going to be visible. But because it's populated with a memory, I thought it would be good to discuss that in the webinar today. So that will kind of be our fifth little thing that we'll be talking about. Okay, so how do we add memories? First of all, let's talk about the acceptable file types, because if you try to upload a file type that FamilySearch does not accept, then you'll get an error message. So for the portrait and for photos, you can upload any of these four image types, JPEG, PNG, TIFF, or bitmap, BMP. For documents, you can upload any of the four image types and also PDF. We're going to skip stories for a minute because, as we mentioned earlier, they, we don't upload a story. As far as audio files, you can upload MP3s, M4As, and WAV files. So of the three uh, things that aren't stories, there are three ways to add those types of memories. So for photos, documents, and audio recordings, number one, you can drag and drop, very, very simple. Number two, you can upload a file, kind of a more traditional way of doing it. That sounds so funny, doesn't it? Uh, you think of traditional as being quite a bit older, but um, for uploading, you know, maybe we've been doing that for years and drag and drop is a little bit more recent. And then the third option is to select something that you've already put in your gallery. So let's just look quickly at each of those three methods. So drag and drop could not be simpler. At, uh, for every memory type, you'll see this dotted line here, and that represents the drop area. So what you want to do, it, of course, it'll be a little bit different depending on what operating system you use, but this is an image from Windows 10. So I just open up my file explorer in Windows 10. I find the memory that I want to add, and then I just drag it with my mouse straight over to the drop area, drop it there, and it appears as a memory. Again, couldn't be simpler. But sometimes, I, you know, I think it's going to be more trouble to try and open my file thing and find it and whatever. And so I might prefer, for whatever reason, to upload a file. Well, that's pretty straightforward, too. You just click Upload. And again, this will be a little bit different depending on what operating system you're using, but you'll get a, a file listing. And so you just navigate to wherever your file is and then select that file and it shows up as a memory. The last one, selected from gallery, is a little bit more complicated, but not, not that much. It's just a nice option if you know that a memory is already there in the gallery, and you can go ahead and select it. So what you do, of course, is click, click on Select from Gallery, and you get this pop-up window. And you notice here, I started from Documents, but wherever I had started from, it would open the gallery, and it would only show me gallery items that are classified 
according to whatever section I started from. So if I started from documents, it only shows me documents. Started from audio, only shows me audio. So that's nice. It's already kind of pre-screened for your pre-filtered. Let's make a, a, a little bit, let's take a, a little larger look at this screen. So when I click any memory, a blue check mark becomes highlighted here to show that I have selected it. And you can select more than one. So if you have multiple memories that you want to attach to a person from your gallery, you just go through and click all those memories and they are selected. And then when you click, oh, sorry, I forgot about that. I've highlighted the little check mark there. And then when you click attach documents, whatever documents you have selected are added as memories in the selection or in the um, type of memory, the section from which you started. So we didn't, the purpose of this webinar wasn't to go into great detail on the gallery. So if you do want to catch that other webinar that goes into the basics of the gallery, there's three ways to find it. You can visit the BYU FHL webinar index page, which Marin mentioned. You can just Google BYU FHL webinars, or you can search on YouTube. Any of those methods will allow you to find the webinar on the, the basics of the gallery. Okay, let's talk about how to add a story since that's a little bit of a different animal, if you will. So there, you can see that there are two options here for adding a story. One is to create a story, in other words, type into an online form, and the other one is to select from a gallery. Now on that, selecting from a gallery might seem a little bit misleading. So just to let you know, the only way that a story would be available to select from, a gal from the gallery is if you had already typed it into the online form. So at some point you will have had to type it into the online form. But once you've done that and you have it in your gallery, then you can select it from your gallery. So let's look at how you create a story in the online form. You just click that button and you get taken to a screen where you can just add the elements of your story. So first of all, you give it a title and then see here where it says story, you just type, start typing the text of your story. So this is what it looks like. Your title just appears there. The text of your story appears. I wanted to call out that you can attach photos to this story. So that's actually somewhat of a new feature, maybe within the last couple of years. You didn't used to be able to attach a photo to a story, but now you can. You, so you click Upload or upload photo, or you click select from gallery if you want to pull the photos from your gallery. The one thing to be aware of that threw me a little bit when I first started attaching photos is that I assumed that once I uploaded them, I'd be able to reorder them. So I didn't pay much attention to the order in which I was uploading them. Come to find out that you can't reorder the photos once you've uploaded them and attached them to a story. So if the order is important to you, just be sure that you upload them in the order in which you wish them to appear. Now, this is another thing that threw me, and so I wanted to comment on this. I assumed that this public link would allow me to click and either make the story not public or public, but actually that's not what it is. It's just meant to be a reminder to us as users that this memory and all other memories you put on FamilySearch are visible to all other users. So if you click public, you actually aren't going to make it not public. Instead, you're going to get a longer explanation explaining that all memories are, are public. It's just a little pop-up window. So just to, to be aware of that. And then finally, when you've got everything the way you want it, you click Save Story, and the story appears in the Story section of the Memories tab. Finally, let's talk about how you can add a portrait. So you notice here that we've kind of got this placeholder. It's just a, a little blue avatar. Uh, there's a similar one for, for uh, females. It's a pink avatar. Whenever you see that, you know that a portrait has not been set for this person. And it's really easy to set one, actually, as long as you've got the photo. <laughs> and not so easy if you have an ancestor that you don't have a photo of. But you just go ahead and click on the little placeholder 
placeholder. One thing I did want to point out is that once you set a portrait, it's going to show up for all users of Family Search. And that is actually a change from the past. You may remember that, oh gosh, I want to say maybe it's been a year or longer ago, everybody could set their own portrait. And so I might set a portrait for my ancestor here, and then my sister might have set a different portrait, and each of us would see what we chose. Well, what Family Search found, according to our expert Beth Ann, is that nobody was using that feature. So people weren't, or very few people were using it. So people weren't really setting their own personal portrait. So why offer a feature that people aren't using? And so now, just whatever portrait somebody picks, that's the portrait that's going to show up for everybody. If you come across the portrait that you you know don't feel is appropriate or you don't uh, feel that it represents the person in a good light, then you're very welcome to change that portrait. And again, it will change it for everybody. So you click the portrait actually to display the menu. Because I don't have a portrait on this person, I only have the option to add a portrait. Once you have a portrait, this option of adding changes to modify the portrait. And I think you even have the option to remove it, if I remember correctly. But for now, I've got an option to add a portrait. So I'm going to click Add. And I get this pop-up screen here. So I like the little notice that they've put at the top here for us to consider how would this person want to be remembered. Sometimes I look at portraits and it's, for instance, a picture of a tombstone. And if that's all we've got, that's, you know, that's perfectly acceptable. But if you've got your choice of actually having a photo of the person as opposed to some other thing that's not a photo of them, that might be kind of a better way to remember them. Or if you've got a really poor quality photo and a really good quality photo, probably want to choose the good quality photo. Again, just thinking, how would that person want to be remembered? Because again, these are real people. These are our family. Just because they're on the other side doesn't make them any less real. So it's kind of a, a nice way to honor them, to choose a, a photo that puts them in, uh, in a way that they'd like to be remembered. So there are three options here that will be um, pretty familiar to you as far as a choosing a memory for that portrait. One is that you can upload a photo, and that works exactly as we've already discussed. The second option is that you can select from the gallery. The third option here is just a little bit different. So you notice that there are a set of photos down here beneath the two options. And these photos are actually taken from the person page of whatever page you're on. So I think the reason they must do that is because they assume that the photos on the person page are most likely to be the ones that you would pick for that person. So you just pick one of those photos and it becomes set as the portrait. One thing I did want to comment on is that if you upload a photo from this screen, the uploaded photo is automatically added to the gallery and also to the photos section of the memories tab for that person. This I wanted to talk about a little bit because it threw me when I started using it. The, the screen operated in a little bit different way than I was expecting. So for one thing, I wasn't expecting the photo to be so much larger than the little photo frame here. But fortunately, you can zoom the photo here with using this control on the side. So if you drag it down, it's going to be smaller. If you drag it up, it's going to be larger. Then also, if by chance you get a photo that's maybe rotated 90 degrees to the left or right or something, you can rotate that photo so that it's showing correctly. Now, this is the part, actually, that the other two things, they, they were kind of straightforward. But the thing that threw me is that I, when I uploaded the photo, and obviously my um, ancestor's face is not showing in the photo frame the way I would want it to show. So I started trying to drag the photo frame like you would on other memories. But 
didn't work. And so what you have to do is to actually drag the image so that it's centered in the frame. So if that saves you a little bit of frustration, then that's a good thing. So you drag, you resize it, rotate it if necessary, drag it into the photo frame, get it just the way you want it. And then at that point, you click Save as Portrait, and the portrait does not show up. Instead, you get this little timer button. But the interesting thing about the timer button, according to Beth Ann, is that it only shows up until you refresh the page. So normally, it's not going to take a long time. In fact, the differentiator between a, a quick photo and a slower photo is that screen photos will be visible immediately. In other words, photos that you've already uploaded and they've already been looked at by a human and determined to be within policy. So those photos show up immediately when you refresh. A new photo might take a little bit longer because it's waiting to be screened. But honestly, I've never had a photo take longer, maybe than two or three minutes. So it's not like you're going to have to wait for hours or anything, at least in my experience. So if you refresh it and the little... Um, a uh, timer thing here shows up again. Just wait a few minutes and refresh it again, and you should see your photo. And there the photo has been set. Oh, one thing I did want to comment on this is that if you set as your portrait photo a photo that someone else uploaded, you don't have control over whether they might delete the photo. Well, FamilySearch took that into account. So suppose that, um, let's say that my cousin uploaded this photo and then for whatever reason decided that they didn't want it public anymore. They didn't want it uploaded, so they delete the photo. Well, FamilySearch will not remove it from my page. So if I've set it as a memory, as a portrait, it's going to remember, excuse me, I misspoke there. If I set it as a portrait, it's going to remember that I did that. And even if the other person deletes it, it's not going to be deleted from my page. But if they delete it and then I change the portrait, I cannot get it back. I hope that makes sense. So once somebody else is deleted, It'll stay as long as I don't touch it, but if I remove the portrait, then I can't get a deleted portrait back. So I hope that's clear, but if not, please ask a question in the chat box and we'll address questions at the end. Okay, let's talk about adding details to a memory. You might recall or you might have had the experience of getting a box of photographs like my sister and I did. I think they came to us via my grandmother, if I remember right, and we opened the box and looked at the photos, and guess what? Many of them were just completely unidentified. And my sister and I looked at those and thought, oh my goodness, here's this treasure that we have no idea who most of these people are. Well, thank goodness for modern technology, because now we can take advantage of that and we can identify the memories that we add to Family Search so that later on, other people who see these memories won't have to wonder who they're about or, or who added them or anything like that, where they came from. We can add all that information to the memories that we put in Family Tree. So let's walk through adding details about a memory. For this, um, we're going to use an example of a photo that I uploaded, which is of my mother and my grandmother visiting Stonehenge in England. And this was back in the days when they didn't have the fence around it, and you could actually walk up and touch those gigantic mammoth stones. It's really quite an amazing experience. So you notice on this photo, we've got this um, exclamation mark in a red circle. And we're going to see why Family Search has put that there. So I'm going to click the memory to add the details. And when I do that, I get taken to this screen. And you notice that there's that red uh, circle with the exclamation point again. And the reason that it's there is that I haven't told Family Search who is in this photo. Now, because I uploaded it 
or because I attached it on my grandmother's page, it assumes it's probably about my grandmother. So it says click to click the image to tag to Minnie Hendrix, my grandmother. Now, of course, you may have an image that doesn't have the person in it. Maybe it's a picture of their home or some other um, thing that doesn't directly relate to them as a person. And so, you you know, you don't have a face to tag. So in that case, you wouldn't have to do it. But and actually, you could still to um, indicate that it, it is about that person. But here, we do have a face that we want to tag. Now, I'll, I'll admit something rather humorous about this. It took me a little while to realize that wherever you click, that's where it's going to put the, the tag frame. So I would just kind of click randomly wherever on the photo, and the tag frame would show up not on the person's face, but off in the corner or whatever, wherever I had clicked. And I finally figured out that if I wanted the tag frame on my sweet grandma's face, I should click her face. Or if I'm going to tag my mom, I should click her face. So I click my grandma's face here. And lo and behold, the tag frame appears right where I want it. Now, if you need to reposition it, you can actually drag this frame. And again, this is unlike the portrait where you have to drag the picture and you can't drag the frame, but here you can drag the frame. So you can just drag that to reposition it. Also, if it's not large enough or not as small as you would like, you can click this green circle right here and you can click and drag it and that will allow you to make that frame larger or smaller. And when you've got it just like you like it, you click Save. Now, after you save the tag over a person, it disappears. And that's actually probably a good thing because if you have it, you know, it can clutter up your photo. But then you might wonder, how do you get it back? Well, it's really simple. If you want to see where a tag is on the photo, you just hover your mouse. And when you do, when it is over a, a tag frame, it's going to show that tag frame for you. Oops, I didn't mean to go past that quite so quickly. So another thing that you can do is add a title. So I have added a title here, but suppose I want to edit it, then I would just click edit title, that little tiny writing right there, and I get a form that has the, the current title in it, and then I can just make any changes that I want and just click save. And that title is visible in two places. It's visible on the Memories tab, and also it shows up beneath the thumbnail of the image in the gallery. Let's walk through a few of the other really cool features about that, that you can use to add details for a memory. One that is amazing, how I wish we could have done this for, you know, old-fashioned photographs, it, just paper photographs, but of course it's not even an option. But in Family Tree, you can click this button right here and you can actually add audio about this memory. Just think how amazing that would be years later for your um descendants or cousins or whoever to come along and actually hear your voice describing that photo. Right below that, you've got a count of the number of people who have viewed the photo, the memory, and you've also got a count of comments. Well, how do comments get added? There, there's a form just right below here. Very simple. You just type in a brief comment here and then click Save, and those comments are displayed right below the memory on this Details page, not on the, the Memories tab. You do have to go into the Details page to see them. Now here, oh my goodness, these are wonderful ways to add important details about your memory. So you can add an event date, you can add an event place, and you can add a description. And I think sometimes we tend to put that off. We think, oh, I'll get to it later. But I would just strongly encourage all of us to do that right when you add the memory. Because as, as we've probably all discovered, later very often doesn't come. We just don't ever get around to it. So when you add the details about the memory, just take a minute to add all the pertinent information. And then that way it's there for everybody, including for you later on. Because have you ever gone back to a photo that you thought you would never forget? 
forget. And then you looked at it and you don't recognize some of the people that were in it, or you can't remember what year it was taken. So just take the time while it's fresh in your memory to record those details. And I can guarantee that you and other people will be glad that you did. Okay, this is a really cool thing. Adding by adding the date allows sorting by date in the gallery. And date sort is planned for the memories tab too. There's not a set date when that will be available, but it is planned for the future. So if you set the date now, that's going to make it easier to do date sorting down the road. Okay, this is a really cool feature. For those of you who are familiar with the gallery, you know that you can create albums there. And albums are just ways of organizing your photos. So I, for instance, got an album for grants, photos that have to do with grants. I could have an album for my Bescoby line. I could have an album for childhood memories. I mean, the sky's the limit. You can just set whatever albums you want. So when you open up a memory, if it's already in an album, the name of that album is displayed here, but you can also add it to another album. You could put a memory in as many albums as you want. So for instance, this one could belong both in my childhood memories and in my grants album. So I can put it in both places. Makes it super easy and super effective to organize your photos. And here is a really cool new feature too. I, mean, I, I just, it's so amazing when you think of all the options that Family Search makes available to us. So you remember we reviewed the story memory type where you typed it into that online form. If you have a photo here, you can click add story to bring up that form and then type in the story that relates to the photo. So that's a quick and easy way to kind of do the reverse of what we talked about before. Before we talked about inputting a story and attaching a photo, here we've already got the photo and we can input a story that will go with that photo. And then finally, down at the bottom, you've got the name of the person who contributed the photo and when they contributed and contributed it, and then also the file name. Here is a cool little feature that is also pretty recent. I would say I've noticed this maybe within the last, I don't know, four to six months. If you click the name of a contributor, so I'm going to pop over. Actually, if I click my own name, that was my name, and it didn't bring up the screen that I wanted to show you. So I've gone to another photo that's contributed by somebody else. And if you click the contributor's name, you get this little pop-up. So you are able to request to view your relationship to that person. You can see their email, which I've blurted out here for privacy purposes, or you can send that person a message. So this is a great way to get in touch with somebody if you find that they're a, a contributor of a photo and you just want to find out, you know, how they're related to you or where they got the photo from or just whatever. It's a great way to get in touch with other family members. Okay, let's head into the last section of our webinar, which is other options on the Add Details page. So these are options that may not be specifically related to identifying the photo, but they help in other ways. So one is that you can easily navigate between all the photos on the person page by using these navigation options at the top. And I discovered that if you are on photos and you keep clicking next or previous, it doesn't just stop at the end of your photos, but then it rotates into the next section. So when you get done with photos, it's going to start displaying your documents and then it's going to start displaying your stories and so forth. So this is just an easy way to navigate between all the memories on the person page. Like suppose that you, after this webinar, you decided, wow, I really want to go on my grandmother's page and add a date to all the memories because most of them don't have a date. So you could just bring up your first memory Add the date over here, click next, add the next date, click next, and so forth, and just easily cycle through all those memories and add the dates and add whatever other information you wanted to add. 
this is um, just a simple thing that I wanted to point out because it isn't necessarily obvious. When you're on this detail page, the easy way to get back to the person page, to the memories tab on the person page, is just to click the person's name up here. When you are viewing a photo, you might want to make it larger or smaller. Did I? I can't remember. Okay, I did. I couldn't remember if I had the little numbered thing there. So the first option lets you zoom in. In other words, it makes the photo appear larger. The second option, that minus, lets you zoom out, or in other words, make the photo smaller. You can drag this photo just like Google Maps. So if you wanted to drag it to a different position, maybe to see a certain part of it and then zoom in on it. If you've dragged it out of its normal place, then this little icon right here recenters the photo back to, to its original position. And then finally, this last one lets you view it in full screen, which means it gets rid of all this other stuff along the edges and just lets you see the photo on the screen. And that actually makes it appear larger because all the rest of the stuff is out of the way. And you hit your escape button on your keyboard to get back. Okay, let's go through these other menu options. We've got actions here, and five of them relate actually to the gallery or to managing photos. And then, oh, excuse me, I had that backwards. Five of them relate to just managing your photos or taking action on them. And then four of them actually relate to gallery actions. So let's look at each set of those. So the first one that just has to do with photos is that you can open it in it, open this photo in a new tab in your browser. You can rotate it left or right, or you can download a copy. And remember, all memories are public, and so any user can download any photo that you put there. And then the last one is, if you decide that you don't want this photo available anymore, this is a place where you can delete it. These other four options are actually gallery features. So you can add a photo to or add a memory to an album. Now you might be wondering what this change to document is. So you remember there's four different categories for memories and photos can be classified as a photo or excuse me, I should say images can be classified as a photo or as a document. So you might have classified a photo as a document and then you decide, no, I really want that to be a photo. And so if you want to change that, there's only those two that you can go between is photo and document. So I had classified this one as a photo. And so it gives me the option if I want to, to change it to a document. And what that means is on the person page, on the memories tab, then it's going to show up in the documents section. Or if you're selecting a document from the gallery, then it's going to show up as a document. And then if I had uh, categorized this as a document, this would instead say change to photo. And so I could change it to a photo and it would be classified accordingly. Move to my archive just moves this photo to the archive section of the gallery. It doesn't delete it from this person page, but in your gallery, that photo will appear in the archive. And then finally, you can click show containing albums to show all the albums that this particular photo is in. You notice a little heart up here. You can like photos, but actually this isn't exactly like liking a photo on Facebook or liking a tweet or something. This is more like marking a favorite. So you can like any memory, your own or somebody else's. And what that does is it shows up in your liked memories in your gallery. So that's the, so the, I guess the like button kind of serves two purposes. You can like a photo to let somebody else know that you liked it, but also everything you liked will show up in your gallery as a liked photo. And then we've got the share option. So you've got pretty much what you would expect here, kind of the um, major ways to share a photo. And again, just as a reminder, even if you share this memory to, like suppose on Facebook, that I shared this on Facebook and 
all my friends could see it and not all of them are have a family search login. That doesn't matter. People don't have to have a family search login in order to see a memory that you share. So that's just something to be aware of. You might think that if you tried to share this on Facebook, people would have to log in to family search to see it, but that's not the case. Once you've shared it on social media, it's visible to anybody who can see all the other stuff, all your other social media stuff. And then you've got your email here, and you can also copy a link to um, share that with people in whatever way, you know, in an email or a text or um, however you would like to do that. We mentioned at the beginning that users are responsible for monitoring at least text and audio, but also if you notice a photograph that somehow slipped by screening or you feel that it's not appropriate, maybe you know it's a copyright violation and uh, the, the screeners had no way of knowing that. So if you need to report a problem with the memory, just click report abuse and you'll get a form that will... Um, you know, it has different fields on it that let you explain what's wrong, you know, what your concern is about the memory and supply your contact information and so forth. So hopefully you won't need that, but if you do, it's nice to know that you've got that as an option. So that brings us to the end of our webinar today. In summary, we talked about what memories are on FamilySearch, the specialized way that FamilySearch uses that term. We reviewed the layout of the Memories tab, how it's divided into sections by the four memory types. We walked through how to add a memory and how to add details about memories. And then we finished up with options, other options on the Add Details page. So everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. And Marin, do we have any questions? Uh, it looks like we do have some questions. Um, let me scroll to those. Uh, there was a question about... Um, I have been told that photos should only be people. A headstone photo should be in documents. Is that true? That is a really good question. My understanding is that actually that's not true. Uh, I've not ever heard any restriction on what you can designate as a photo or any other type of memory. So thank you for asking that. Let me throw this back to our other listeners. Um, has anyone seen anything in writing that would indicate that you would have to limit photos to people? Because I have not seen anything in the family search documentation that would indicate that. We do have another question. Um, the comment is, if I see a photo of multiple family members where only one person is tagged by the submitter and I download the photo and repost it and tag all of the persons, will the photo appear twice on the originally tagged person's memories? Oh, that is a really good question. My understanding is no, because if you you attach a photo to a person page, and so unless, well, actually, let me make sure I understood you. I was assuming that, okay, the photo's there, you download it, and I was assuming you were going to upload it to some other page. If you upload it to the same page, I believe you're going to get an error message telling, if, if FamilySearch recognizes it, it will say, hey, this photo has already been uploaded. But if you, for instance, download it and then you change the name and try to upload it to another page, I believe that it will be uploaded there without affecting the other page. Thank you for that question. And we have two more questions. If I add a photo, is it possible for someone else to delete it? Oh, good question. No, it's not. Only the person who added a photo can delete it. Now, that is actually delete, delete it, like get rid of it. Can another person detach it? I'm actually not sure about that. Does anybody on the call know if, for instance, I go into a person page and somebody has put a photo on there and they say it's about my ancestor, but it isn't really, am I able to detach it? I don't know the, question, the answer to that question. Maybe one of our audience members does. Um, someone said that uh, you can 
detach a tag. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, and when you detach the tag, then it's no longer associated with that person. Okay, thank you, thank you. Whoever answered that. And we have another question, and they asked, "Who screens the uploaded photos? Real people?" Yes, real people. And we have one more comment. They asked, "I'm certain I've heard this web before webinar before called Thanks for the Memories. When will the next one come out? I'm looking forward to it. They're so helpful." Oh, thank you so much. We actually haven't set a date. Uh, I would expect I'll need to to talk with Marin about this, but my best guess is that it'll probably be either December or January. But it will for sure be posted on the BYU webinars page when when it's scheduled. Thank you for asking, and thanks for the kind words. I think that's all the time that we have for questions for now. Uh, but just like Catherine said, um, she will be presenting in December and in ja- in January, um, and de- I guess depending on Catherine's schedule, um, that will determine whether it's uh, in December or in January. Um, I'm going to move over to the closing screen here. And um, like Catherine said, uh, you can catch all of our webinars on our website. Um, That's fh.lib.byu.edu. And um, of course, uh, this recording will be posted to the YouTube channel as well. And our next webinar will be with Susan Kaufman. Uh, She works at the uh, Clayton Library in Houston and will be giving us an overview on what it's like researching family history there in Houston. And uh, that'll be at the regular time on Thursday. Following that, we will have a webinar with James Tanner on the 5th. And he'll be giving a webinar. Uh, his webinar subject is how to take better photos for genealogy. So we hope that you can join us for that. Thank you so much. And I hope that you have a wonderful weekend.